Hello everyone and welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Christmas Day is just about over. All the presents are unwrapped and all of the selections have been taken in the 2023 National Draft. Of course, there is a rookie draft and pre-season draft happening tomorrow, which I will cover. There will be no live stream. I don't even think there's a way to follow it in real time other than like Twitter on live blogs or something like that. Um, so that, that content will come. Uh, it is also my birthday tomorrow officially. So um, my... Rookie draft video might be a little bit late, um, but first of all, thank you to everyone who stuck around for both live streams, um, or either live stream, much appreciated. It was good to have you along for the rides. Today's video is just about wrapping um, what we just saw in the uh, national draft, especially for those who uh, weren't able to take part. I'll just give you my general thoughts on the selections that went down. As an aside, I will be making an Eagles video separately. So I'll go into more detail about that, uh, as I so often do go into more detail about the Eagles stuff, um, because it's so close to my heart. But let's talk about day two of the National Draft. I'm just going to pause for you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Good, good, thank you. Um, first of all, West Coast started the second day with pick one, just as they did with uh, day one until Carly Reid. We decided one read wasn't enough, and we added a key position forward in Archer Reed. And a little bit of a surprise, I did a video previewing who I thought we would take, and I don't even know if I mentioned his name. I'll give you more in-depth thoughts about that in a separate video. Uh, but the Eagles get a key forward, and I wanted us to go tall, so good result. Logan Morris uh, was linked to Brisbane, and that's who they took the second pick. And then Geelong were the team that pounced on Mitch Edwards, which was a little bit of a surprise. Their need for a Ruckman wasn't necessarily so obvious. They took Toby Conway last year or the year before. I think it was last year. So to add Mitch Edwards to that, I think it's a good move, uh, particularly where their list transition is at. Adding some tools was a really good result for Geelong, and I think they picked well later in the draft too, which we'll get to. Uh, but straight off the bat, Geelong, I think, will be very happy with that. They back themselves in to get the project tall. Angus Hasty then went to the Saints uh, a little bit earlier than expected, um, especially, especially when Archie Roberts is on the board. We saw throughout this day a lot of sliders. And there's some players, which I'll mention at the end of the video, who remain undrafted and could get picked up in tomorrow's rookie draft. But um, yeah, there was a few sliders on offer and a bunch of them got taken, which we'll get to. So Angus Hasty as a running defender joined St. Kilda. Carlton probably linked, well, actually, maybe this is just what I know. Carlton fans that are friends with me wanted Mitch Edwards. With him gone, they went for Billy Wilson, uh, which was a little bit of a, I guess, a kind of a reach, I suppose, depending on your viewpoint. But that went, uh, that was quite a bolter to pick 33. And then uh, Fremantle, I think this was a trade-up. I haven't actually written down what the trades were. We had several trades today. Um, and an interesting trend in this particular draft, both day one and two, was clubs trading up and offering future picks just to move up one to three spots. And Fremantle uh, moved ahead of, I think, the Cats, potentially on purpose, to uh, to take Cooper Simpson. And I think this is a really good value selection. One that I didn't mention in yesterday's video for West Coast, but one that I was kind of quietly hoping we would pick up. But a, a midfielder with a lot of uh, raw potential. Missed a bit of football due to either injury or illness, I actually forget now. Um, but even though Fremantle weren't necessarily on the market for midfielders in this year's draft, we thought they were going to go um, forward, sorry. Um, they took Cooper Simpson. I think there's a lot of upside to that. And then Geelong uh, took Sean Manor, who I thought Fremantle were going to take. And they add a 26-year-old VFL player who's going to come in and be close to best 22, you'd think. He's going to get a, uh, get a crack. And another good one, I think, for their least transition. They've added the two young long-term key position players. To add in a mature age player, it, it, where they've had a lot of success, they had a lot of success with mature mature age players over the stretch. Um, he can come in in their system and play well, and I I, I just see Sean Manor having a great first season at Geelong. Collingwood then took Hawthorne's NGA in Togiath. I've now recently learned that's how you pronounce it, um, which I think is a, is a good selection. Interestingly, here Collingwood didn't go tall with either of their picks, which was kind of what was expected. They were expected to go. Maybe a key back, certainly, and maybe a key forward as well. I had them taking Archer Reed in several like mock drafts and stuff like that. So they added to Demetia with Toji Yath, so a pressure forward slash midfielder in Demetia, and adding a running intercept defender in Giath. I think that those are good players. Those are good players, just not what we expected. So then we've seen West Coast trade up for the first time in our history, I think. I, I'm used to, I'm accustomed to West Coast trading down to get value. We traded a future third to get up to this pick. And the play that we took was Clay Hall. And as soon as we took this pick, it wasn't necessarily one that I was hoping for, 
But I just felt right about it. And I'm happy the Eagles added a midfielder who um, was the only non-allies midfielder in the under-18 All-Australian team. So I'll, again, I'll elaborate that on that in the Eagles video. Essendon then took the Bulldogs um, NGA in Luam and Lawal. Um, I should note as a side note as well, the two trades thus far with Fremantle and West Coast, I believe were both Richmond. And I will talk about Richmond's strategy because it has been interesting, but they've traded back twice. And I think they ended up trading back three times overall. They then entered the draft for the first time at 40, um, which I think is a good move and took Kane McAuliffe, a big inside midfielder from South Australia. I thought they would probably pick a midfielder. I did expect him to go tall as well. Then Fremantle take one of the biggest sliders of the draft so far in Ollie Murphy. He was one that I thought would have been a shout for West Coast at you know, pick 30, first pick of the day. And, uh, you know, it wasn't so long ago that he was talked about as being a contender for Essendon at what was probably pick 11 at the time, whatever it was, yeah. Um, you know, Geelong, Adelaide, I thought those are the sort of clubs that were going to pick Ollie Murphy. It sounds like he didn't test well at the Combine, considered a little bit slow, but you had, it's hard to argue with the performance. And, and Fremantle's strategy here is interesting as well. Outwardly suggested they would go for front half players in this draft. They've gone for the midfielder in Cooper Simpson, and they've gone for a key defender in Ollie Murphy. There's two ways to look at it. I understand that the Fremantle fans in general haven't had a glowing endorsement of what they had done, particularly to this point in the draft. But if you're looking from a value point of view, I think Fremantle kind of smashed it. What is kind of weird, though, is that their first pick last year was a key back, and they've added Oscar McDonald. I know they've lost Joel Hamling, but they're loading up on key backs, which is not a clear positional need, I wouldn't have thought. But on talent, Vic Metro MVP, gun key back, I think they will long-term be happy with this pick which is where Brisbane then added a second key forward. Um, both Logan Morris and uh, Luke Lloyd are slightly undersized key forwards, but that was a little bit telegraphed because we sort of expected them to go for a tall forward. I didn't expect them to get both of those two players. So Richmond then take their second and final selection and take a key forward out of South Australia in Liam Fawcett. Don't know a whole about it, a lot about him, but they've added two South Australian prospects that are a little bit speculative at 40 and 43. So what I'll talk about here with Richmond is their... their their strategy here, I think, was really sound. I think this part of the draft was quite even. So they thought, look, we'll, we'll take a couple of hits in the, in the short-term um, pecking order and accumulate picks for next year. So I think somebody said in the live stream they've hold two future seconds, maybe three future thirds and two future fourths or something like that. The benefit of this strategy, which I think is really good, is that with next year's compromise nature, it's going to be even more compromised with academies by the way, I'm going to do an Academies video sometime after the draft when I get time. Um, but what that allows Richmond to do is they've got heaps of draft picks now that they can condense and trade with, you know, uh, whatever play, uh, clubs have Academies and Father Sons next year. Adelaide, Carlton, Gold Coast and GWS probably. I uh, know Gold Coast certainly has one. There, there's several and uh, maybe even a Hawthorne Father Son. I can't remember off the top of my head. But it doesn't matter. So Richmond are in a position to trade, you know, two future fourths and a future third and upgrade to like pick 20 in the same way that the Bulldogs did for Gold Coast pick four. So I expect Richmond are loading up for 2024 uh, and are going to be in a really good position to get a really strong draft hand. And that's probably all they could have really achieved today. Their hands were tied. So um, on the whole, I think Richmond should be quietly confident about the way things are going right now. What I mean by that is it's not a great position to be in list wise from the outside looking in, but I think they've done really good proactive moves there. GWS then took Joe Fonte, a uh, running defender out of the Perth Damers Football Club, represent the other team that I represent that really sucks. Uh, but yeah, West Australian running defender to add to Joe uh, James Leak. Uh, so interesting mix of players there. Joel Frazier then went to the Bulldogs, and uh, then Bodie Ryan, the running defender from South Australia, went to Hawthorne. Not too much commentary I can give you on those players as such. Oh, I know Frazier quite well because I was hoping West Coast would pick him. And I think the Bulldogs are obviously looking at their next generation midfield. They've got a long-term look at that. And Frazier, as more of a wingman who floats forward, does add something different to that mix, having taken Riley Sanders in the first round. Then they took a Ruckman, who I don't know nothing about, in Lachlan Smith. Um, they just lost Jordan Sweets. Probably makes sense from a list point of view. Port Adelaide traded up here to take Tom Anastopoulos. Uh, so what Port did was obviously 
didn't have the greatest draft hand. In fact, the worst draft hand I've ever seen, maybe in history, which is just pick 74 going into this draft. They did a few live trades. You traded out, you know, feature third and fourth or something like that to get into this draft. And I think it's good that they added a few draftees. So Tom Anastopoulos joined as a small forward. West Coast with their final selection would take Harvey Johnston, a forward midfielder that I am still learning about uh, before I make an assessment of what I think of him, but seems to have some nice attributes. And it's an interesting mix from West Coast here going powerful mid, obviously in Harley Reid. Then they took a key forward. Then they took a, a really probably underrated midfielder in Clay Hall when you consider his resume. And then a more of a speculative midfielder in Johnson. So a clear look at the midfield in this year's draft. Pick 50, St Kilda, no idea who Hugo Garcia is. I'm not even gonna try and lie to you. Um, but that is what always happens at this end of the draft. So congratulations on being drafted, Hugo, no disrespect. I just don't know anything about Hugo. And I, um, I presume that St Kilda do. Pick 51, Brisbane were kind of only expected to take two picks. And I suppose they, they assessed the situation and had a look at uh, what talent was going to be there. They decided to take a third pick. And having taken two key forwards, they decided to go with a key back in Zane Zakostelski, a player that I actually picked as West Coast first pick of the day. So he did slide a little bit, which is an interesting one. But I do think there's a lot to be uh, to look, work with there from an athletic profile point of view, from uh, the fact that he's late to football and the fact that he's not even 18 years old. I think Brisbane... This is one I kind of saw coming a little bit because they do have a tendency to draft out of WA. They like, obviously, we're looking for key position players. I think that could be a good one, and I think he could still grow to be close to that 200 centimeter mark, considering he's not even 18. But I then, Port Adelaide then took another small forward in Lockie Charlson. Um, so adding two small forwards was interesting, obviously having lost Orazio. Sydney then took a uh, Brisbane Lions Academy player, I believe, in Patrick Snell. He's listed as a key forward. His description says key back. I presume he will be developed as a key back. And Sydney get their only key back of this year's draft, um, which was highlighted as a need for them, obviously, in terms of their list. Essendon, again, I wasn't sure if they would take this pick. They ended up taking it, and they added their second running defender for the draft, uh, which was interesting. So Luam and Luau, and then Archie Roberts, arguably the biggest slider in this year's draft, picked probably... I feel like mid-year, Toomey had him in the top 20 or around that mark. So for him to go at pick 54 in the end, I think is a good move. Uh, well, a good result for Essendon. And uh, in terms of value for talent, uh, Archie Roberts was widely considered to go top 30, even you know days before the draft, I think. Or maybe in the 30s. The Bulldogs then pounced on Aiden O'Driscoll. So they took five picks, which was more than I expected. So Sanders, obviously, and Croft, two first-round picks, smashed it. Um, yeah, they did well to, to move those picks around to get Riley Sanders. And then obviously Jordan Croft is a little bit lucky, but that's still a great result for them. Then uh, who else did they t I say they took? They took Joel Frazier, the wingman. They took another wingman in Aiden O'Driscoll and then they get the young ruck. So a nice balance there for the Bulldogs. They get their ruck, they get their key forward, and they get two outside such wingmen, and then they get their inside mid and Riley Sanders. So I think the Bulldogs can walk away from this draft fairly happy with the way it's gone. Hawthorne then got Cal Shadia, the father-son key four that they'd sort of committed to with their final pick. They left the draft there. And the Port Adelaide got one of the bigger bargains, I reckon, towards the end of this draft in Will Lawrence. He's a player that, because I thought West Coast were interested, be a bit of a big footy rumor, I then researched him, decided I really wanted him. Port Adelaide getting him at 57, I think, is a bit of a bargain. And I think he could be a decent wingman at the next level. Geelong then took another big slider in this year's draft, George Stevens, the ins ins insanely huge inside mid, um, who just looks like a 30-year-old already. And you just get the sense that um, he could play early because of his physical stature. I don't know what he tests like in terms of endurance, but I probably think he needs to lose a few kilos. But at 58, you definitely take that every day of the week. And Geelong get their, um, well, somewhat local George Stevens. I don't think he's from Geelong, but I think he played for the Falcons. GWS then committed to Harvey Thomas, their last um, you know, uh, academy player. I don't know anything about him, respectfully. Fremantle then took another big slider. This is where a lot of the sliders are coming in. Jack Deline, the South Australian small forward. Uh, again, a bit of a goal machine. Probably has his limitations with respect to endurance and work rate, but kicks goals. And I think this pick really rounds out Fremantle's haul. Had they just walked away with a key back and a midfielder, Hadn't really addressed list needs. I think a small forward was on the shopping list. To get him at the end, I think really rounds out a good recruiting hall for Fremantle, to be honest. 
Geelong then took Oliver Wiltshire. Um, respectfully, don't know anything about him. I'm not the only one. I can remember on the live stream, a lot of people were like, who is this guy? Um, but back in Geelong's late recruiting. So we'll see what happens there. And then one of the biggest sliders all night, Ari Schoenmaker. There was a lot of you know questions firing in the chat. Like, why is this guy sliding? A few theories. Um, St. Kilda probably intended not to take this pick and then probably looked at it and thought, Sean Maker's worth a crack here. A bit of an oversized flanker um, and a bit of a playmaker. Could be a key forward, could be developed that way. We'll see. But I'm, I'm happy with Sean Maker because this would have been a stressful night for him. Um, he could have conceivably gone... In, I had him as the second pick today. So that was just what the um, outside belief was. Then a couple of WA boys went in the last two picks of the night. Geelong took one out of Swan Districts, and then the Brisbane Lions took Reese Torrent out of WA as well. And I did kind of feel that coming, only because I feel like Brisbane have this knack for taking random WA players that are underappreciated, and they do well with them. The two I'm thinking of are Jackson Pryor and James Tunstall, and I think they did well those two picks. And Torrent was another player I was looking at going, I can see this guy actually doing well at AFL level, and I feel like Brisbane are the sort of club that would pick him. I didn't have them going, him going to them in the mocks because they've got so much midfield talent, I thought they might just overlook this one. Sure enough, they added Reese Tyrone. So that is basically what happened today, and I will give you a little bit of a rundown of some of the talents that we expected to get drafted and didn't. So here are some of the bigger names, at least in terms of media rankings, that are still on the board ahead of tomorrow's rookie draft. Cohen Sanchez from Western Australia didn't get selected. Tarkin O'Leary is another name still out there. Nathan Philactides, a small defender, didn't get drafted. Will Patton from South Australia. Will Brown, the uh, Sandringham midfielder. And I, I keep mentioning this, but I think it's quite an achievement that he was best on ground in their premiership winning grand final. Um, so to, to do that and go undrafted is a little bit unlucky. Matthew Carroll's another one. Keenan Brown. There's Riley Wetherill, who's floated in and out of mock drafts over the time. Jack Callanan from South Australia. And a player that I was really hoping the Eagles would pick in Cade Delarue. Potentially, with pick one of the rookie draft, he goes there tomorrow. I find the rookie draft is so far apart from what people expect to happen that there's almost no point doing a mock rookie draft because you'll just hear of players you've never heard of before. But it's fun because you get some late gems uh, out of nowhere. So fingers crossed for these boys. Um, you know, thoughts are with them. Colin Sanchez probably in particular out of that group. Really thought he would get drafted, I'd imagine. Um, same thing with Tarkin O'Leary. There was a lot of noise there that he would get picked up and remains undrafted. But hopefully clubs um, pull the trigger tomorrow. Helps for Sanchez. West Coast have pick one. There's a chance there. Bit of a small forward need anyway. So that is how round two and beyond went down of the 2023 AFL draft. Guys, like I said, thank you so much for taking part in the live stream. Thank you for you know um, participating in the channel over the last few weeks. I am going to make a few more videos about the draft and then probably relax for a day. And I, uh, my current intention is still to upload until the end of November. So um, don't go too far. If you are um, looking for footy content, I know we're about to hit the, the true off season, the real wilderness of it. And I'll think about my approach over time, but I've still got, I've still got heaps of content that I want to get out over the next week or so. So stay tuned for more. Thank you so much for your support over the year and I'll see you in the next video guys. Cheers.